is my first body of work, what I call my post-impressionist period. This is work that I did between 1971 and 1977. After I got out of high school, like so many people at that time, I was a hippie and sort of pursuing sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but uh, not really worried about careers or college. Uh, so, but at that time, I started painting pretty much on my own. Uh, people always ask me, yes, I started when I was a kid. I always made art as I was growing up and in high school, etc. But I never, I never thought of it as a career. So between 71 and 77, this is the body of work that I was working on and uh, teaching myself how to paint. I was going to museums, I was uh, reading books, and I kind of ju jumped right in at what I thought was modern art which is to say post-impressionism, impressionism, a little bit of cubism. And, uh, and I was working one or two days a week, so this is uh, my first body of work. There are about 30 pieces that I did in this style. And basically, yeah, just imitating, in a way, artists that I admired, like Vincent van Gogh and Marc Chagall and Modigliani and Picasso a little bit. Um, and so that went on uh, for, like I say, between 1971 and 1977. And these are just examples of that period. There's a lot of self-portraits, the usual subject matter, landscapes, still lives, uh, etc. Some of these, I, the ones I'm showing you, are I consider very successful. There are a whole lot more that are embarrassingly bad. <laughs> but I was sort of teaching myself how to paint uh, at that time. Okay, so finally, after pursuing a few years of music and working odd jobs at this time, I pumped gas, I made pizzas, I worked construction, etc. Finally, around 1977, I was uh, 24 years old, and I thought, well, Rooney, maybe you should get a job, go to college, pursue a career. And I was living outside of Philadelphia at the time, so I enrolled at several of the art schools in Philadelphia. There are quite a few good ones there. Uh, one that accepted me, though, was Tyler School of Art, part of Temple University, so I enrolled and started as a student at uh, Tyler in 1977. The first thing that happened to me uh, when I started art school was our class took a field trip to New York City. And we went up to see the retrospective of an artist named Jasper Johns at the Whitney Museum. And I absolutely fell in love with the work of Jasper Johns. And I was a, one of those, revel it was a revelation to me because I didn't know you could make art like this. Like I say, my idea of modern art ended with Picasso and Cubism. Um, but suddenly I saw the work of Jasper Johns. I went back to art school and immediately stopped the post-impressionist style of work and adopted this style of work, which I refer to as my sticks and string period. And basically, for in the beginning, I was kind of imitating uh, Johns and other artists like his friend Robert Rauschenberg, who worked in that style. Uh, I, I ultimately made it my own, but I began pursuing certain very sp uh, specific ideas about art. And in a nutshell, and this is these four pieces here are, are part of that period. In a nutshell, these are the ideas that I was exploring in the art. First of all, I wanted to combine painting and sculpture in a single work of art, which is common now, but it was not common in, in the late 70s or before that. So, and I consider myself a painter primarily, but I wanted to make three-dimensional objects that were paintings, but that were also sort of part sculpture in a way. That was one idea that I had. Another idea that I pursued was making art that would age the way people age. So I chose the most humble materials, such as newsprint and uh, uh, tissue paper and things like that. And I used those materials knowing that they would change over time and that was part of the idea. So a lot of the pieces have aged in a certain way. This one, for example, when I first made it, uh, this paper that I'm pointing to right here was white. Uh, but now it's gotten old and gray and full of sleep, to quote the poet William Butler Yeats, like people do. Now again, that was very much a part of my idea. And I, I just want to mention that, you know, I was raised Catholic. I rejected that entirely, and so for most of my adult life, I was an existential atheist. I believe that what you see is what you get. So uh, the idea that art shouldn't last, I saw that as a very existential idea. Now I see it as a Buddhist idea, but it was basically you know, the concept that art, like people, like life, uh, should not last forever. Uh, the, and uh, apropos of the existential idea, I also was very interested in making objects. I didn't want to make pictures, I didn't want to make windows on illusionary worlds. I wanted to make objects that spoke for themselves. I'm, pr I'm very much an abstract expressionist painter, and now I combine abstract expressionism with realism. Um, but 
a lot of the work here was uh, painted first and assembled second. So what I would do for seven years, and I did this work all through undergraduate and graduate school, what I would do uh, during this period is I would, you know, and, and this is what I did in art school, so while other students were painting still lives, I was in the back of the room rolling wooden dowels in uh, paint and uh, splashing and dripping, and so I had this running pile of material uh, that was already painted. And so for seven, six years, this is the way I worked. I would take some of this painted material and I would hold it up to the picture. And you know, this, for example, is something that I mixed my paint in. Um, but I liked the way it looked and I put it into the work. But uh, it was sort of a collage method, meaning I would hold something up to the work and if I liked it, I would either glue it or tie it or in some cases nail it uh, into the work. Um, but if I didn't like it, I would just take it and throw it back in the pile. So everything was painted first and assembled second. The other thing that I experimented with was what's called shaped canvases. Um, so it, I wanted to play around with the idea that paintings didn't have to be rectangles or a tondo or a circle or squares, that they could be uh, different kinds of shapes. And a lot of these pieces, again, they're meant to be very fragile. I'm sort of restoring some of them right now, but the whole idea was that they would decay. If they were kept in basements in the dark, they look pretty much the way I made them. If they were hanging in a window for all these years, they got very old the way, the way all of us do. And it is abstract expressionist painting, but very meticulously put together. So if you take a piece like this, which I call flame, it's made of tiny little pieces of painted newspaper that I would collage piece by piece. So the point is, even though it looks very spontaneous, it's actually very meticulously uh, put together. I used a lot of grids in my work. And again, in those days, this all changed. We'll get to that in a minute. But I was sort of a gloomy existentialist, just in my mind, not in person. Um, but I used a lot of grids to symbolize the idea that you try and build things in life, whether it's a marriage or a, a career or home, whatever, you build things, but they're doomed to fail in a certain way. So the grids represented that. They're, they're broken grids. So it was my metaphor for trying to build something sturdy and solid, but knowing and thinking that parts of it would fall apart or wouldn't work. This was my existential view of life at the time. That's what I call my sticks and string period. I went to uh, four years, I got a BFA degree from Temple University, Tyler School of Art. Then I ended up at Maryland Institute in Baltimore to get my graduate degree. I was there for uh, two years. So for six years, this is what I did. What I call my sticks and string period. And I did, uh, for every piece you see, there are another 50 more. In 1983, I graduated from Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. I was working as an artist model at this time as a way to make a living and also to make connections. So. I modeled for all of the art departments in the Washington, D.C. area, met a lot of people uh, involved in the arts, uh, and always mentioned that I was interested in being a professor, but uh, the, the uh, modeling work was very instrumental in helping me see how to teach art at that time, also to make connections, and it paid a pretty good uh, wage for, uh, for considering the job. So. So that's how I made my living for a while. I finally got a, my first teaching job at the Corcoran College of Art and Design, and so I began being a professor at that point. But I switched styles a little bit, and I think there's a continuity in all of the work that I do, um, but of course you have to move on. You can't make the same painting over and over again. I've been painting for almost 50 years, so I'm always changing styles, even though I... The nice thing about having a retrospective is you see the continuity in the work, even though the style on the surface seems very different. This is what I refer to as my neo-expressionist period, and that was very common uh, in the 80s, making art that was deliberately kind of crude in a way, meaning I started, well, in this case, I started putting figures into the work. Now, I still considered myself an abstract expressionist painter. What I mean by that is the materials, the texture, the motion, the colors tell the story. But I wanted something to hang this story on. So for one entire year, I painted nothing but heads. And uh, these and these are two of them. There are, again, or maybe 30 of these. Some of them are quite large. Um, but I, And I was working from my imagination. I wasn't really interested in necessarily in painting figures, but I wanted to 
add something to the pure abstract expressionist techniques that I was using. So I painted heads strictly from my imagination. They were totally, they weren't meant to be anyone in particular. They were genderless. Most of them didn't have hair, et cetera, but I was just sort of experimenting with combining some figurative elements with the abstract expressionism. Uh, I, these paintings are made out of joint compound mixed with acrylic uh, polymer. Uh, so I would mix up this mixture of joint compound and acrylic polymer and uh, create a very bumpy surface to try and paint figures on, and then I would try and paint figures on top of the surface. There's always been an element of collage in my work and recycling, so when I was making these paintings, before it dried, sometimes I would pick off some of the semi-frozen little chunks of joint compound, and the same thing, I'd have a big pile of this stuff, and then I would pick it up, and if I liked it, I would collage it into the uh, artwork, which is what you see here. So there's sort of a mosaic element. And again, I, you know, I started teaching figure drawing not long after this, um, but my figures, I wasn't interested in anatomically correct figures. It was still really the power, the, uh, power of, the, of the work. What happened, though, with this work is, as I went along is they be, started to become more narrative. So suddenly the heads began to incorporate symbols. I incorporated symbols in with the head. So you, you can't see it here, but I would put crosses and cups and all typical of abstract expressionism, all improvisatory. I, so gradually know, the work started to become more narrative. They started to tell stories. Uh, at this time I was approaching 30 years old. I was, there was a lot of the work at that time was a sort of conflict between a kind of domestic a lifestyle, getting married, having children, having a home, and then my kind of wilder, artist-free lifestyle, and a lot of the work at that time. And all of my work, by the way, is very autobiographical. They're all based on true stories. You don't really need to know the stories because hopefully they become universal. But basically, this was all of this work was about adjusting to the changes in life, learning how to leave certain people behind, how to move on, etc. From there. Uh, so this one is called Cauldron, for example, and it, as you can see, as I said, the, I'm still working from memory here. I'm not interested necessarily in anatomy or anatomically correct figures, but I wanted to tell stories, and the storytelling started to get more and more specific, so again, this is, you don't need to know this really, but this is me and my girlfriend, and sort of surrounded by a, a bouquet of flowers, and, but, and, and a lot of the work was p t two people trying to come together, but pushing apart at the same time. So when you read some of these figures, that's essentially what the storytelling that's going on. Gradually, as time went on, the storytelling became more and more important. And I've always worked in different sizes, from life size, easel size, to large paintings like this. This one is very specific, that's me. Now, I, I wasn't going for a likeness whatsoever, but nevertheless, because I'm still improvising here, I'm not using any models whatsoever, painting strictly from memory. Um, but more and more symbols, more and more storytelling, so that's me, this is my girlfriend at the time, uh, that's our cat living in Adams Morgan, it's called Rain Cocktail, that's us having a cocktail at night in the evening uh, together. But here again, there's a lot of conflict. You know, you might, Life at that time was, was extremely conflicted and I was kind of angry and didn't know how to you know, move on in life. And as I said, I was, like so many people, learning a lot of lessons about leaving one thing or one person behind and moving on to another, very difficult lessons to learn. Um, a lot of symbols, and again, this is improvisatory or free association, but they're kind of specific. As I said, I was raised Catholic at this time, I was not I've always been a spiritual seeker, but I certainly wasn't Catholic or Christian. But, as they say, you can take the boy out of the Catholic Church, but you can't take the Catholic Church out of the boy. So a lot of crosses, uh, cups, uh, symbols like that. Um, and a lot of patterning, etc., etc. But still, again, I consider it abstract expressionist storytelling. It's really the materials and the color and the texture, but they're getting more and more uh, narrative. I won't talk about each piece because everyone has a very specific story, but I'll spare you that. But the general themes are, again, a kind of conflicted, confused, um, 
approach to life, or just a rite of passage, let's call it that, that you're moving, learning how to move on in your life, and very difficult, we've all gone through it, but that's what a lot of these uh, pieces are about. Gradually, a couple of things happened. They, again, became more and more narrative. I've always been a storyteller in my work. Even the sticks and string period kind of told stories only without figures, etc. But at heart, I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories in my work. So what happened was a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to become more realistic. Not like a Trump lawyer or a Renaissance painter, but more actual anatomically correct figures. So I started using uh, photographic sources at this time. Uh, so some of these uh, figures that you see here are taken from photographs. This one is called Muse Two. It's a series, two pieces I did on the muses, uh, the figures who inspire artistic creation. So, and some of, some of my, you know, I like, I don't, I, I title my work as sort of an entry point for the viewer. I don't want my work to be too easy, where I explain it and then you walk away and like a joke and you got it and now it's over. I want there to be a mystery in the work, but I don't want it to be so mysterious that viewers look at it and have no clue what they're looking at. So I use, so my work is poised somewhere in between. I like what Duchamp said, the viewer completes the picture. So I have a certain intention in mind, but I like the viewer to bring their life into it. But this one is called Muse 2. It's two pieces. I, I don't do the same theme very much, but in this case I did. Uh, it's, uh, it's the story, of the, it's inspired by the muses who inspired artistic creation. In each piece I put a piece of art that I admire, in this case Michelangelo's David, and an artist that I admire, in this case John Lennon. This is the artist, so that would be me or anyone struggling to find their voice. So, and again, I'm not, I don't like to be that literal, but sometimes they are literal. This is the artist trying to find his voice, trying to rise up through the muse, and yes, I'll freely admit that sensuality or sexuality is definitely a part of my artistic creation and kind of inspires me in a certain way. It's not just that at all, but there is an element of, I do see a, a tie between eroticism and artistic creation, so, and I'm a heterosexual male, so I use a lot of naked women, if you will, in, in my work. You can interpret that any, any way you like. Uh, but she's the muse. Uh, so yeah, sensuality is kind of the muse here. Um, and here again, I sort of went back. Now this is much later. This one is 1990. But I kind of repeat motifs a little bit. I change my style, but the broken grid kind of popped up back into my work. And in this case, it wasn't a literal grid like in the earlier work, but a painted grid. But it symbolizes the same thing. Trying to find your voice. This is the artist's studio. I'm trying to work your way uh, up through this grid, trying to build something to get to your ultimate goal. I want to mention too that I, I became a professor in 1986. I've been a college professor teaching art ever since then, right up until, until the present. I've always been very inspired by my students, so a lot of things that I was never taught, and I'm not complaining about this, but I was never taught in uh, art school. I thought I should teach my students, not just teach them what I do, but teach them everything. Uh, so, uh, so I would teach things like ink wash drawing or uh, stipple drawing or various things like that, even though I never did it, but I would, felt I needed to teach my students. I'm mentioning that because one of the things I began teaching is linear perspective, and linear perspective is very, very difficult. I'm mentioning that because I've always been a cubist. My space, the space in my art has always been uh, things floating around in kind of an ambiguous space. The space is, so, so that's always been a part of my work, but in this case, I, I became intrigued by things like linear perspective. I would see my students doing it, and I would try and teach it to them, but I was frankly learning it myself at that time. But here, you can see an example of that, uh, the linear perspective going back into the distance, even though it's still kind of an ambiguous space. So the big change in my work, more and more storytelling, started to use models, Via, I was teaching figure drawing, but I couldn't afford to hire the models who worked for my class. Sometimes they would model for me in exchange for art or a dinner or something like that. But generally, I 
I started then what I'm still doing now, and that's using photographs as my models. So that changed. They started to become a little bit more realistic. And the other stylistic changes, uh, everything up till now has been acrylic paint. I started using oil paint. Again, the first, uh, the post-impressionist work is oil paint. Uh, after that, it was all acrylic. But here, in this period, I started using oil because of the richness and just sort of rediscovering what oil paint can do. So that's, uh, that's what happened here. And again, for th this is several examples. There are 30 or 40 or 50 more, um, which of course I couldn't include in the retrospective. But then what happened, I broke up with my girlfriend at the time. I moved into a very small apartment and I had all this work. And you know, I've always worked very steadily. Sell my work, exhibit my work, but I make a lot more than I actually sell. So the point is, I had to move into this small apartment and I had all of this enormous these enormous paintings made with joint compound. They were like walls. And I thought, I mean, this is kind of impractical. You can't just keep moving this work around. So I started working on paper at that time. And I worked on paper exclusively for the next 10 years. And when I say working, this is an example of that. When I say working on paper, uh, I don't mean just drawing, although I've done tons of drawing, but very elaborate, large scale, some even bigger than this, very mixed media works on paper. And the great advantage was that I could ship them easily and I could store them easy, easily. The disadvantage, I, they have to be framed. So I was, when I exhibited them, I was spending $300 each just to have them framed. But this is what I call my works on paper period. And I did that for 10 years, exclusively worked on paper in different sizes. The other amazing thing that happened to me, and I'll mention that while we're looking at this piece right here. Uh, the other amazing thing that happened to me is living in Washington, D.C., I knew a lot of people, and um, my girlfriend, who's a blonde German woman, but she loved India, she had been to India many times, and so we had a lot of Indian friends in Washington, D.C., and one day this artist named B.J. Bagai from New Delhi was visiting some friends of hers in Washington, D.C., and I showed her my work, and a year later, she called me up and said, I've got a gallery, if you and your work can get over here to New Delhi, we'll have a show. So with the help of my girlfriend, and I owe a lot of credit to her because she took charge of the whole thing. I could have never done it myself. We packed up about 20 or 25 of these works on paper and we went to New Delhi, India, and where I had a, I had a show there. And it was an incredible experience for two reasons. One, the show itself was very successful. I had crowds of people coming in the gallery. I sold a few pieces later on in Washington, D.C. to some Indian friends that we knew. I had tons of publicity. I was on television three times. I was in, uh, had print uh, reviews of my work, about 15 or 20 of those. So the show was very successful, but India itself was one of the most influential experiences I've ever had. We spent five weeks uh, there, and I was going, I won't go into the details, but I was going through a very rough period uh, in my life at that time, and uh, so suddenly my existential atheism was not cutting it. And they say that you don't go to India, Mother India calls you. So I ended up in India, um, and I was, again, I won't go into the details, but I was, at this point I was at the lowest period of my life for, for various reasons. So I needed something to change my way of thinking and India answered that call. So I went to India and if you've, if you've never been to India, it's like no other place in the world. It's kind of love it or hate it, but it's very, very spiritual. It has a 2,000 year tradition of spirituality and it was in the air. Uh, so I fell in love with India. We spent five weeks there and I just had an incredible, amazing time in India. This is, and India itself inspired me for the next few years. I don't have too many examples of these, but I started reading a lot about Buddhism and Hinduism, and it informed my work in, in many ways. This is a travel log of India, you know, the most straightforward piece. I went to India, and this is what I saw there. Adorable little children, but begging on the street, etc. All kinds of animals. Buddhas, Muslim monuments like the Kutam Minar, snakes, which have a whole different meaning in Indian mythology than they do in Christian mythology, elephants, real elephants, but also elephant-headed gods like Ganesha, etc. Uh, so India was a turning point both in my career and my life. I say I converted to happiness. 
I went from being an existential atheist to what I am now, and that's an aspiring uh, Buddhist. But India was kind of a lifesaver for me. I was literally looking for something to, to change my way of thinking, and India provided that for me. This is another India piece, and again, and this one's called Desire. And it's pretty self-explanatory. If you know anything about Buddhism, the idea is to rid yourself of desire, but it doesn't mean just superficial desires like sex or food or something like that. It means ridding yourself of desire in a deeper way. Um, but that's what this piece is about. It's called Desire. And of course, I used a lot of my India work, I used very traditional symbols like lotuses, of course, Buddha, a lot of Hindu gods. I was planning on doing all the Hindu gods, and there are about 2,000, so I got through about six of them. But I, 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 I painted a lot of Krishnas, uh, Kali, uh, Shiva, etc. India which just kept me going in terms of my work for two or three years. I, and, and when I did Indian symbols, I don't have these here, but if I did Shiva, for example, I tried, I, I made it my own, but I kept the traditional symbols, meaning the cobra around his neck, the trident that he holds. So I was using the traditional Hindu mythology, but kind of making it my own. Uh, then I, I got back to the States again, sort of, you know, newly restored, if you will, or newly inspired. I Just to repeat, I converted to happiness at that point, and I've never looked back. I always say, I've been depressed, I've been anxiety, I've been sad, and I've been happy. Happy is better. <laughs> so, so I try and hold on to that as much as I can. But I got back to uh, the States. And I started doing this body of work. Now this is what I call the American goddesses, and I want to explain this work again. I don't want to be too literal. On the other hand, I don't want to, people to misinterpret my work. And in fact, when I showed this work in uh, a gallery in Washington, D.C., I got reviewed in a local newspaper, and the, re the critic called me an underwear fetishist. <laughs> so, I, and I later saw that critic, and I had to explain to him, no, you missed the whole point of the work. So let me explain to you the point of this work right here. I call them the American goddesses now. So bear with me here, but I, I will explain this work. First of all, as I already stated, I'm a heterosexual male, uh, so I don't deny that seeing women in their lingerie is appealing to me. So I, I, I don't want to, you know, skirt around that issue. That's part of the reason that I made this work. However, it's not the main reason. My work is always reflective of the pictures that we see. As I tell my students, uh, when we're talking about art, I show them Van Gogh, I show them Rembrandt, etc. But they have very little, like society, have very little interest in that in traditional art. So with them, I point to their computer screen, I point to their phone, and I say, this is our art. This is our art in the 21st century, the media, and all of these thousands and thousands of pictures we see every day. So all of my art is kind of reflective of that. It's uh, not overtly a commentary on it, but it all comes from our art, the, the media. So in this, these particular pieces, I would read the Washington Post and the New York Times first thing in the morning when I had my coffee, and I'd be reading over here about war and poverty and et cetera, et cetera, of the world, and then over here would be a full page picture of a woman in her lingerie. And just to repeat, I have nothing against pictures of women in their lingerie. However, I started to think, what does this have to do with this? So what the critic missed, and no, I'm not an underwear fetishist, but what the critic missed is this. And, and I believe that sexy is great in art, sexist, not so great in art. So with these pictures, I, I anticipated that there would be a dual reaction perhaps, that some people would find them sexy, some people might find them sexist, but my disclaimer at the time was, whatever you find, especially if you find them sexist at all, don't blame me. Go to the Washington Post, go to the New York Times, because this is where I'm getting these images from. So that was part of the commentary. Now one other thing as far as the source material for these pictures is I wanted to get more and more realistic. And I needed models, I needed figures. And this is true even, even now. Um, it's very, you know, one of my pet peeves is I hate to hear the expression, that's so real, it looks like a photograph. And again, this is a major part of my work even now. Uh, because photographs, anyone who knows anything about photography knows photographs are not real at all. That most photographs are 
very unreal. So even now, when I'm using photographic sources, the hardest part for me is finding a photograph that is realistic enough to paint from. So, and again, I prefer to hire models, but I'm not successful enough to pay models what, what they charge. So these photographs, the last thing about this particular body of work, is these photographs were very good to work for, meaning they were full figures, they had beautiful lighting, and I don't really copy the photographs. I still use advertising and fashion photography in my work, as you will see towards the, the next part of the, the latter part of the work. I still use that, but I'm not trying to emulate fashion photography at all. So what I do is I get rid of the Gucci bags and the jewelry and I try and make these women look more normal. But I use these sources just simply because, again, the first step working from photographs is finding a photograph that's good enough, that's real enough to work from. So that's what I was doing here. I'll say two more things about these pieces. Uh, one, I'm, it's still very much a combination of abstract expressionism. In this case, I literally did a little Jackson Pollock gripping there uh, with realism, and that's still what I do. I try and put those two things uh, together. I spent a lot of time making loops like this, and I have a very specific uh, reason for that. To me, that represents samsara. And samsara is the Hindu and Buddhist concept of birth, death, birth, death, etc. So my idea, uh, or my metaphor for that, was to make sort of like infinity symbols only expanded. These loops have no beginning and no end, but they still seem to be in constant motion. They're not dead loops, so that's my symbol for what I now believe. Birth, death, birth, death, over and over again, and that's what the, the loops symbolize. All right, uh, so the next phase of my work is, I, like so many people, I got a computer. And I got a very cheap design program that I bought at Walmart for $30, and I started playing with it on my computer, so I started what I call my photo paintings. And there are several reasons for that. Again, it's kind of a disclaimer. Don't ever say to an artist, that's so real, it looks like a photograph, because you're insulting the artist if you do that, because most oil paintings look a heck of a lot nicer than most photographs. Not all, of course, there are good photographs, but the, again, the photographs that we see all day, every day, uh, are not as beautiful as, as most paintings. But what I wanted to do was sort of, uh, there's two reasons I started working with photographs. One is I just had a lot of fun playing around, you know, no experience, no one taught me how to do this, but you know, I was playing around with design programs. Click here and suddenly you, it turns into warm colors. Click here again and it turns into cool colors. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, you can make it blurry, you can even, click and make it an impressionist style or what have you. So kind of irresistible for an artist to just play around with that. So that one, that's one of the reasons I started doing that. This is a tree, a, pho a photograph that I took in Nice, uh, in France, and it's uh, called Tree in Nice. But this is a good example because I made about five versions of this photograph, and they were all a little bit different. So what I would do is I'd take the picture, manipulate it on the computer, then build a wooden support and glue the picture on there and then paint over and around it with with oil paint so it's very much a combination of photography uh, and uh, painting i also spent some time in you as a, you know i love to travel and uh, travel is a big influence on me like it is on most people most artists so i've been to paris a few times and i found that very inspirational so this piece and i love classical music I love all music, I hasten to add, not just classical, but all kinds, including classical. And my favorite period of classical music is late 19th, early 20th century French classical music. Maurice Ravel, Claude Debussy, Poulenc, people like that. This is Claude Debussy. So I made a little homage to an, an artist that I admire. That's one of my sources for my art. But the little trick here is I painted Debussy, I painted the bird, I painted the Claire de Lune, the light of the moon, that's all painted. The Eiffel Tower is a photograph. So I was kind of reversing, again, the idea that somehow photographs are more real than painting. And uh, so that's a, it looks like a pointless painting of the Eiffel Tower, but it's actually one of many photographs of the Eiffel Tower uh, that I took. Um, and moving right along again, you know, this is uh, it's a big space in here, but I certainly couldn't include everything. 
that I made. This is one of my earliest photo pieces, and here again, I'm sort of combining different uh, techniques, etc. Um, and I'll just mention this a little bit. This is a photograph of me. Uh, this part I painted. So the nose and the eyes are the painting. This is the photograph. So again, I'm just playing around with the idea that a photograph somehow being more real. And I just want to hasten to add, because I teach a lot of young college students, 18 years old, and they live in their phones. Uh, so they see literally thousands of pictures every day. So the important concept with the photography and, the, uh, and one, of, one of the things I'm getting at in this work is that it's all, I try and tell my students this, it's all contrived. Don't mistake what you see on TV or in your computer for reality. It's no more real, in fact it's less real, than a Renaissance painting. And that's sort of the important concept because I think a lot of us, not just my students, but a lot of us look at TV and think that this is reality without realizing that it's all contrived. They're just like any art. People are putting it together to make you think a certain thing or feel a certain way. So that's the concept behind a lot of the photographic work. Just playing around with photography and computer design, but even more important, conceptually trying to spell the myth that somehow photography is more real than other forms of art. This is called Starry Night. It's a little bit of an inside joke, meaning if you look closely, you can see the cypress tree, like in the Van Gogh painting. You can see the great wave, and you can see the, the uh, moon up, up in the sky. So it's my little homage to Vincent Van Gogh. But this one exemplifies everything that I've been saying. And what I mean by that is, I try, instead of making paintings that look like photographs, I wanted to make photographs that look like paintings. Uh, so this is primarily a photograph. There's very little painting here. I added a little homage to, to Van Gogh, but all, all the rest of it is a photograph. So I like to think it looks a little bit like a Rothko color field painting, but it's the reverse. It's a, it's a photograph made to look like an abstract painting. So I work with photography and, and painting, combining the two things. I'm really a painter for quite a long time, maybe another decade or so. Oh, by the way, this is another version. I, one of the assignments I give my students is to make a self-portrait without drawing yourself. That's what this is, because I made this when I first moved where we are right now to Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And this is one of the first pieces I did when I got here. This is a tree in my neighbor's yard, combined with a view of lower Manhattan. So it's a self-portrait in that way, because I was going, like all artists, New York is still the art capital of the world. So I was going back and forth, which I still do, COVID intervened a little bit, but at this time I was go take going into New York quite a bit. And I didn't live there, but I was spending a lot of time there, so I think of it, combining, think of it as combining my life here in Hazleton with my forays into uh, New York City. So I started, and again I did you know, a whole lot of these for about 10 years, I worked with photography. Gradually over time though, I kind of lost interest a little bit in the, or let's say I felt I said enough about photography that I wanted to say, and I sort of got tired of playing around with clicking here and clicking there. To be completely honest, it's almost a little bit too easy in a way. I mean, I, I hate to say that, but I sort of got bored with just changing the colors by just clicking, and I wanted to get back to using my own hand and my own arm to paint with. So that's when I started this series, and this brings us up to almost current times. I started this series in about 2018, and this is very much what I'm trying to do here is combine abstract expressionist painting, which is really where my roots are, where my heart lies, but with realism. And I'd be the first to admit I'm, at this point, better at the abstract expressionism than the realism, but now I'm pushing the realism part too, but I, I want both in the work. So these works, this is how they start. They all start as drop cloths. You can tell this is corrugated cardboard. So I put the cardboard on the ground as I'm working. It's a drop cloth down here and I'm painting up here, but I'm dripping stuff. I, occasionally I spill stuff and then I look and I kind of manipulate it a little bit. Uh, that's how I start the painting. Then when I finish one painting, I put that aside and I take the drop cloth that I've been kind of manipulating in an abstract way and I mount it on wood that I, or wooden support that I build and then I paint realistically over top of it. And I always, as I said earlier, I don't want people to look at my work and have no clue what they're looking at, but I also don't want to make it too easy that you would just explain it in one sentence. 
So they're all narratives. The general theme of all of this work, or let's say the, the general iconography, the uh, picture, the uh, images that I use are these. People, nature, in the form of flowers or trees, and animals. And the overriding theme in this work is uh, global climate change. It's a, it's, a, it's a comment about nature, and I found I, you know, I sort of identify with animals a lot more than I ever did before when I'm feeding the squirrels in my yard or looking at the birds. Somehow now I look at them and I think, yeah, they don't write books or play their violin or etc. But they're just like us otherwise. So I have this sort of newfound affinity for the animal world. So I try and make very user-friendly animals, if you will. Then though, as I said, their narrative, this is called wildlife. And what happens is I usually start with the figure. And again, I call these figures from different sources, but a lot of it is fashion photography. Sometimes it's pictures that I take. Sometimes it's pictures, as you will see later, that I find on Facebook, and I ask permission of the, the people who took the photographs if I can use them. I don't want to copy anything, but I do want good sources for realism. So as I said, this probably started out as a fashion model, but I transform it. I want to make them more like real people. This is called wildlife, and there again, you know, the general theme I kind of explained, but the specific theme I leave up to the viewer's imagination, where they can see whatever they see there. To elaborate on that just a little bit, in this piece, the, the uh, drop cloths, started to become more and more like paintings in themselves. In other words, at first it was just spilling stuff and dripping stuff. Then I started manipulating, using my hand, but manipulating the, the drop cloths. Uh, and then in this case, yeah, there was already an abstract painting, or certainly in this one, there was already an abstract painting before I had the figurative uh, elements. And I always joke, after when I could do that part, I mounted, if I were, and if you, hopefully you'll get this reference, but if I were Cy Twombly, I'd be done. <laughs> but I, that's just my starting point. So I have what's essentially an abstract painting. Now, the reason I, I do that for two reasons. One is, it, again, it's my metaphor for life. Life is about overcoming obstacles, uh, you know, trying to work your way through it, even though you run into some rough territory. So I try and make a ground that is already kind of agitated and then try and impose order on it, if you will. That's just simply my metaphor for life. But on a technical level, the abstract expressionism is the starting point for the figurative elements. And what I mean by that is, when I, after I mount the drop, what I'm calling drop cloths, but as I said, some of them are actual abstract paintings that I do on the floor in a way, but that sets the mood. So if it's a calm mood, I make it a, I take my cue from there, I make it a calm painting. If it's an agitated mood, I make it an agitated painting. If it's light, that sets the tone for the elements that I'm gonna put into the work, and it aids my composition. So what I mean, I, you know, this is a good example because a lot of this stuff was kind of already a nice painting, to tell you the truth, but what I do is I look for gaps in the composition. Oh, well, this is working beautifully. I'm not gonna to touch that. I like that the way it is right now. But there's sort of a big gap here. So why don't I put the figurative element there so it sort of aids or guides me in my composition. Then I have a whole pile of photographs that I collect and I start going through them. So in this case, I found this photograph of a woman, again, probably an ad, an ad or something like that, but I, she seemed to fit there. And the point I'm making here is I don't determine the narratives first. The narratives come second, kind of halfway through. I go, oh, I see where this is going or what the story is. So in this case, I started with her, and I thought after I painted her, she looked almost suspicious or a little afraid or kind of looking out in a certain way. Um, and so then I decided to add this man, but uh, the man became kind of sinister in a way. And this is called Dollhouse, by the way. So again, I. I use the title for the viewer as a starting point, like, okay, what am I looking at here? And I'm not referencing the Ibsen play directly, but I'm using the same thing. This sort of became a little bit of a story about domestic abuse to a certain extent. Uh, so then this I actually painted from life. I, for some reason, I have some props around my studio. and I, I had this doll, although I added the head from another source, but I painted this from life, and then I painted this, and it, to me it all, Dollhouse, the theme of that is women being treated like dolls in a certain way. 
Uh, but again, that's the narrative here. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to explain it too much because you can read any narrative you want. In this case, though, I think it's, I won't say it's obvious, but yes, he does look sinister. You call it a dollhouse that says, says a lot. But uh, as I said, I don't start with a theme and then illustrate the theme. I just start with an image and see where, see where the image takes me. So this is a series I'm working on now. I won't go through each one, but uh, but again, they're all examples of how I start the picture. So this one's a little lighter in mood, in my opinion, because it was literally lighter. And this one, interestingly enough, I got some of these little drips for something one of my students did, and they left it behind because uh, I get a, I get a lot of Jackson Pollock imitators in my class. So one student did this sort of Jackson Pollock. It wasn't nearly as good, but I took it home with me. I thought, oh, great, that'll be a little drop cloth. And so she originally did some of these drips. Then I took the Jackson Pollock part a lot farther. But it sort of had a lighter mood. So and again, I use animals, people, and nature. The sort of general three things that I kind of recycle in my recent work. But this one, I, I call this eyes wide open. Um, and again, it's not a specific narrative, but I would say that this one's a little lighter, a little happier than some of the others. Uh, just to finish this thought, these, this is a good one because, believe it or not, and I have all kinds of stuff around my studio, this part of it right here, all of these drips and everything, this green part, are something that I did in art school. <laughs> around about 1978 and they were I wasn't a very good abstract expressionist then I guess in a way because they were pretty bad but I had them laying around my studio so what I do is I pick them up and I go hmm, what can I do with this and then I glue it in this case I turned it sideways and then I glue it to, to the surface um, but yeah these go way back they just just happen to have them there but my point is this because of the green and all of that, I kind of thought of Northeast Pennsylvania landscape in a certain way. And people always ask me, well, how do you decide what animals, what people? And it's just improvisatory, but I thought this was sort of nature out in the wild. I thought wolves would be appropriate. And then, you know, she ended up in there somehow. But it, again, the point is, all inspired by where I start. The drop cloth kind of leads me to the, to the next element. This is my latest body of the this is what I call my Youth and in Innocence series. And the way this came about is, I've been doing the drop cloth thing for a long time, even my earlier work, but certainly this. That was always my starting point for the past three years or so. But one day, I decided, and again, you just gotta keep moving on and not make the same painting over and over. So I decided, Rooney, instead of doing the drop cloth part, because I, you know, I like to make work that pushes new boundaries, but I'm sure, you know, this is just my fantasy, I'm sure a lot of people look at some of that work and say to themselves, why does he do all that splashing and dripping or what have you, you know, people who are used to more traditional work. And there's many reasons that I kind of explain why I do it, but the point is I thought, one day, why don't I just eliminate the abstract expressionist background, do it in a more traditional manner, build a wooden support, then gesso the wooden support, and just do the realistic part without the abstract expressionism. And that just happened one day, but you know, I feel very grateful because in almost 50 years, my muse has never deserted me. And what I mean by that is I've never had the equivalent of writer's block. And every time I go in my studio, I, I always know what to paint and start painting. And then I get really inspired. So I started with this picture right here, which I call First Rose. But I started to like the idea of not having the abstract expressionist ground, and I sort of half, halfway jokingly say this. I mean, I'm a little worried, I'm not sure this is a good thing or a bad thing, but for the first time in my life, I'm making pretty pictures, <laughs> which I had never done before. And, but I think that's me mellowing in my, my old age. I'm a lot more relaxed than I used to be in a way, so pretty pictures kind of work for me at, at this point, and that's what I would think of these pictures as. Now, I, I call it my Youth and in Innocence series. And it just so happened, this is a, an ad uh, from a, a newspaper or a fashion magazine or something like that. I, somehow she ended up, and again, I, I try not to copy. I want to change the mood, but she ended up being much younger than the person in the ad. I kind of like that, um, but that's where that came from. So I thought of yeah, Youth and Innocence as kind of the theme. And I just want to say some of my sources, this is a woman named Shreya. 
She lives in uh, Calcutta, in India. We met on Facebook. I don't know her at all. I just want to explain my sources. Uh, but she started liking my work, so we became friends on Facebook, and now I like everything she posts. She likes everything I post, but here's my point. She, like so many young people, she posts these beautiful selfies. So one day I wrote to her on Facebook. I said, Shreya, do you mind if I used your selfie to make a painting? Because I'm sort of, I don't want to say practicing, but I'm interested in portraiture. And like I said, making portraits. And the first thing is you need a good photograph to do this from. So I said, Shreya, do you mind if I use your photograph to paint from? And she said, no, of course not. Please do. I said, that's Shreya. Now I've done Shreya, I think, four times <laughs> so far. Um, and she doesn't mind. She likes it. And she's Indian, so that's why, you know, I just sort of, Taggers are kind of associated with India. Uh, lotuses are associated with India. So that, that's Shreya again. And you know, she looks a little sad there, and it's interesting because I don't know if Shreya looks sad in the picture, or even that's just what came out. Uh, but that's my source material uh, for all of this work. Now I want to hasten to add, it became a whole series. I've now in the past two months done about 20 of these pictures. They're all young women, but I don't want to give the wrong impression, so I will give a little bit of a disclaimer here as far as the content of this work. This old man is not lusting after young women. That, that's not the point, but I am lusting after youth. <laughs> so there's kind of a nostalgia factor here. I like to think back to when I first fell in love, when I was 18 years old, before all of that happened. So I call it my Youth and Innocence series because that's what I'm trying to do here, is, is portray a, a more youthful, calmer, more peaceful, I don't know what else, what word to use, uh, but a more kind of innocent, harking back to a, a time of life when life was simpler and, and more innocent. That's the series that I'm working on now. I'll just say one other thing about these. I do improvise. I use the you know pictures for the models here, and this is another woman who I met on Facebook who I don't know, but I always ask permission. She posts, this, her name is Rosa, she posts a bunch of beautiful selfies too, so they're irresistible. You know, this was the first one. I said, oh, Rosa, I love that. Do you mind if I use it to paint your book? No, no. And in fact, they haven't bought any of them yet, but she bought this one and she reposted it, etc. That's where the imagery comes from. Some of it, this is a fashion model again. You know, I'm saying fashion model. I don't want it to look like a fashion model at all, but that's the sources for these paintings. I make up the backgrounds. I want them to be simple. I don't want them to be elaborate landscapes. So again, they're almost a new kind of abstract expressionism, meaning instead of Jackson Pollock or de Kooning, Slash and Gash, this is more like Rothko. There's a quiet, subtle thing that I want here. So like Rothko, I'm just dividing the picture plane into sections and then just, and, and it's interesting because I've never been a big fan of what they call minimalism in art. I, I mean, I. I I just don't, I'm not against it, but what I'm getting at is being minimal is the hardest thing for me. For all of my career, I fill up every space, I splash, I drip, you know, I can't hold back. So this is a sort of a challenge for me, in a way, because I'm trying to just make color fields without crowding it uh, too much. So it's still figurative art mixed with abstract expressionism, but a different kind of abstract expressionism. The one last thing I'll say about these is, I've always been a cubist, and, if you, and cube, cubism has nothing to do with cubes or very little to do with cubes. What it means is ambiguous space, not as opposed to frozen time where everything is in this single space. I've always just sort of floated symbols around. This is one of the, but now I'm kind of using more believable space, meaning rather than just floating symbols, I want them to be simple. But if I start with this and she's leaning, but I don't want to what she's leaning on. So I just make up a table. Uh, this is called By the Sea, and then I make up a, a landscape. And somehow this one just uh, reminded me of the sea. And again, I'm not trying to paint seascapes in any great detail. I want to keep them simple, um, but I'm adding backgrounds and, and not so ambiguous space like I used to be. And that's it, folks. Uh, that's, that's my retrospective here at the Hazelton Heart League from 75 up until last month, I think. I painted some of